David, for having given us the opportunity to come here to your house, to your home, in a beautiful place, which is the Isle of Wight, in, in Wight. Um, we, we will have been very, very happy to have you in our conference, as you know, on the 25th of this, uh, February, we will have a conference for the program, which is called Camino del Misterio. Okay. Um, but for us, it's a great opportunity, you know, to be here, and at least to have some words from you for our, you know, because we will be in the conference. So, first of all, thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure. I, I, I couldn't make the conference because um, uh, one or two people are, um, are trying to damage me at the moment, and um, I have to um, focus on that in the next few weeks. And twenty yeah. fifth of February is pretty much in the middle of it. So, but it's, but it's great to have an opportunity, you know, in this way anyway. Mm -hmm. Many of our readers and people who listen to the program would like to have the opportunity to know a little bit about you as a person. How to how would you find yourself as, as a person? Who is David? Allen? Well, I, I've got a, a chapter heading in one of my books, um, I'm not David Icke, because, you know, I see the difference between the true self, which is consciousness, and the experience my consciousness is having, which is at the moment it's called David Icke. Um, and we can get so mesmerized by identifying with our name, our job, uh, our culture, country, race, that we lose the real self-identity, which is consciousness. Um, the David Icke personality level of me um, is the, the way I interact with the world, I, I guess, um, is a strange contradiction, you'd think, because everything that I've pretty much done in my life uh, whether it was a professional footballer um, or uh, then a journalist and television presenter with the BBC and then a national spokesman for the Green Party and then all this stuff that I've done since 1990. They've all been in, a, in the public eye. They've all been in, in, in the public domain. And yet me, I am a very private person who doesn't like the the whole public thing. I, 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 it's, it's funny that my, the way my life's gone when, when that's, that's me. Um, for instance, you know, when I, when I do an event, um, I'm back at the hotel as soon as possible, you know, in my own space, because that, I, I just like that, that, that privacy. I mean, I spend now, I mean, most of my life has been with other people, but, um, over the last five years, uh, I guess, um, something like 90% of my life um, is alone. It's here, working, researching, and all the other things. And I go out walking alone. And I love interacting with people. Um, I love the events and the interaction with the audience. I mean, that is just the, the, the nicest thing in my life uh, in terms of my work and everything. But I'm a very private person. And, um, I, I, you know, I... Um, I don't like the public side of it. I, I'd much rather be anonymous. Um, but given what I'm trying to do, I can't be. And that's been a, been a challenge for me. So you can imagine what, uh, what it was like to experience in the early 1990s that absolute historic proportion level of ridicule that I went through in Britain. Um, when the person experiencing it was someone who doesn't like the public eye, doesn't like, um, likes privacy. And my whole life was like, here he is, look, every facet of it. Uh, but it did something for me. Um, you were chatting before about how did I overcome the fear of reaction from people in terms of w what I'm doing and saying. Um, and, and it's all kind of tied into that because the greatest prison or one of the greatest prisons right up there uh, that most people live in is the fear of what other people think. When you fear what other people think of you, then you're no longer living your life. 
you're living their version of what you should be. You're editing your life, you're censoring your life. Um, you are going through these mental processes of what do I leave out? What do I not say about what I feel? Um, and how do I put what's left in a way that's acceptable to these people so they won't think I'm crazy or whatever? Um, that's what happens when you fear what other people think. Well, my concern about what other people thought of me um, was hit by some nuclear weapon, it seemed like, and just shattered. And, and that was the years, and it still goes on today in the mainstream media in Britain, but um, who have no idea what I'm saying. They've never bothered to find out. You know, he, he thinks this is run the world, that's it. That's as far as it goes. Is, is there any more? No, no, it's just... That's it. So you, you're always going to get that from the mainstream media. But in, in, in those days, in the early 90s, um, early mid-90s, uh, I mean, it was just incessant ridicule. Now, when you, when you even walking around here in, in, in your, you know, the town where I live, um, was, was ridicule and laughter. Um, going into a bar or a pub, just impossible, forget it, it was just uproar. Um, and um, when that happens to you, you either fold and just withdraw from the world. And it was tempting, but never considered. Or, like, like steel going through fire, you come out a different person in a way and I came through it without that concern anymore about what people thought of me now when you um, when you know when you look at life you can see it as a series of random events this happens then that happens and that happens all by accident or when you look at your life and it certainly it's blatant when I look at mine you can see things happening that eventually become a clear sequence of events that are leading somewhere. And when you think of the, the information that I'm writing and talking about um, years after that period of mass ridicule, if I had not been cleared out of the fear of what, of what other people thought of me by that experience, that extreme experience, there's no way I would be talking about and writing about um, hybrid bloodlines connected to uh, non-human reptilian entities and, and, and moons that aren't what we think they are. I mean, you would, you, you, I mean, you'd go, I, I ain't saying that. What are people going to think of me? And because of the ridicule, um, I can do it without any even vague resistance of what will people think because people can think what they like they have every right to think what they like but then so do I and that's the bit that we forget often and and so I, when I look back at that mass ridicule I can't say I look back at it with affection it was horrible um, you know and, and, and my children were ridiculed at school and um, followed to school by journalists and, and, and it was all horrible stuff but it gave me a massive gift, and I've said many times uh, in my books uh, and, and, uh, and, and interviews, you know, life often gives you your greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as your worst nightmare. And it gave me my worst nightmare, but it also gave me, with hindsight, my greatest gift. Mm -hmm. Your personal awakening, as you also commented, uh, started in Peru. Um, at least one very, very uh, important experience you have. And I would like to ask you, what intelligence do you think they are, they are behind this personal awakening for you? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question because for people that haven't come across the story, um, through 1989, when I was a television presenter with the BBC and also a national spokesman for the British Green Party at the time, uh, through 1989, I started having this very strange experience that kept on recurring, and that was that 
when I was in a room alone, it didn't feel as if I was in alone. Uh, I was alone. It felt like there was a presence there. And this got more and more powerful until the spring of 1990, when I'm in a hotel in London called the Kensington Hilton, working for the BBC, just a, a, across from where the BBC is in West London. And it was this, this, this presence in the room was so tangible that I sat on the side of the bed and I looked into the room and I said, look, if, the, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you're driving me up the wall. And then just about five minutes walk from here, um, I was with my young son, he was at the time, he's a strapping 30 year old now. Um, and someone stopped me down the seafront where there, there is a, still there today, there's a, there's a news agent shop and bookshop and, uh, near the station. And someone stopped me to talk about football. Um, and when we finished this short conversation, I saw that Gareth, you know, my son wasn't there, but I knew where he was. He was in the shop looking at books. So I walked in and um, I was just said to him, come on, Gaz, we'll, we'll go up the town, get some lunch. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I did so, my feet wouldn't move. This was the first real, if you like, confirmation to me that something real strange was going on. Uh, this is uh, around March 1990, and all I, I it wasn't a voice, um, but it was a very strong thought form, if you like, that went through my mind, that was almost of voice proportions. And it says, it said, go and look at the books on the far side. And I knew this news agent, this bookshop very well, and I knew the books it sold. It sold romantic novels, pretty much, or, 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 or it did sell at the time. And I thought, why do I want to go over the books? First of all, it's like, what's going on? But also, why do I want to go and look at romantic novels? Um, but, of course, you know, you, you, you're bewildered, but you're also intrigued. And I started to walk towards the books. And, my, you know, my feet could move then. Um, and when I got in, all these romantic novels were there, you know, perfectly formed English roses and all this stuff. And then there was one which caught my eye because it was so different right in the middle. And it was a book called Mind to Mind by a, a professional psychic called uh, Betty Shine. And, uh, but, and uh, all I saw was the face in Mind to Mind, her face on the front. And I turned it over and I read the, the blurb at the back and I saw the word psychic. And what really struck me was, would this lady pick up, because I've never been to a psychic in my life before at the time, would this lady pick up? what I'm feeling around me, this presence. So I read the book in 24 hours, I contacted her, and um, she invited me over, and I went a couple of times, and, and what I said to her was not, look, I'm having these strange experiences, I, you know, I don't want to lead people on like that, I want to see what comes naturally. Um, I just said, quite truthfully, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, I mean, look at it, but, um, and, and, and I, Nothing's helped. I don't take drugs. I won't take drugs for it. I, I wouldn't be here now if I had, given I've had it since I was 15. Um, and maybe your hands-on healing, which she also did, would help. So I went, and I got the hands-on healing a couple of times. Um, and we had a nice chat about other dimensions of reality. It all made sense to me. You know? and, and the third time I went, uh, I'm sitting on this, 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 this bench, this medical-type bench that she had. And she's sit, uh, sitting next to my left knee like that, you know, doing the old hands on. And I felt like a, a spider's web on my face, like a cobweb, very, very uh, obviously. Now, this hit me immediately because I'd just read in her book, you know, a matter of, uh, you know, two weeks, three weeks earlier, that uh, when other dimensions of reality, whatever you want to call it, are trying to lock into you, you sometimes feel a spider's web on your face or like a spider's web, a cobweb. And of course, at the time, I'm thinking, what's going on? Now, all these years later, I know exactly what that feeling was. It was electromagnetic energy. Because what uh, the way that communication happens between different dimensions, frequency ranges of reality, if you like, uh, through psychics and stuff like that, is that it, it is done through an electromagnetic projection, a, a, an information field. So the information field um, is uh, just 
information, energetic vibrational information. So um, an English psychic would, would tune into that projection and they would decode it into English. A Spanish psychic would connect into the same information field and communicate it in Spanish, etc. Anyway, about I didn't say anything to her about this, this feeling, uh, the spider's web, and she's doing that. And then about 10 or 15 seconds after I'd felt that, she goes, oh my God, I've got to close my eyes for this one. This is powerful. And I'm going, ooh, what's going on here? It's all new to me. And then she starts telling me in March 1990 that... Um, these figures in her in her, in her mind's eye projections again. Um, I mean, she hasn't got two uh, physical bodies in her head. It's a projection, um, something to to focus on. Um, and she was telling me what these figures were asking her to tell me. And it was that I was going to go out on a world stage eventually and reveal great secrets. That I was going to write a series of books. Um, that there was a, 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 an energetic transformation coming, which I dubbed the truth vibrations at the time, because what, what I was told was this energetic vibrational change, which I now would describe as an information change in the information fabric of this universe, was going to act like a spiritual alarm clock. It was going to wake people up from what they were in, which was a, a basically a hypnotic state, a coma state, living a fake reality, as I would say today. And that um, these, these truth vibrations, this vibrational change was going to have that effect. It was going to get people to start waking up like Sleeping Beauty from the, from the, the, the amnesic state. And it was also going to bring to the surface all that had been hidden from us. Um, and if you think about it, that, that was 22 years ago as we speak. In 1990, there was absolutely no sign or evidence whatsoever that there was going to be some colossal human awakening. Uh, and certainly there was no evidence that all this stuff that has been hidden from us was coming to the surface. But when you look at it now from the perspective of 20, early 2012, um, you know, wherever I go in the world, and I did a, a big world speaking tour last year, so I, I spoke in, in all parts of the world, there is a global awakening happening. It's not the vast majority yet, it's not the majority yet, but at different levels, people are awakening and they're looking at the world and themselves and reality in an increasingly different way, more expanded way, and events in the world um, are... In, in many ways triggering this because people are looking at this mayhem that's going on and going what's happening what's happening they're looking for answers um, and then you, you 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 look at what we know now about how the world is controlled by a, 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 a network a cabal of families that control the banking system the political system the transnational corporations the oil cartel the pharmaceutical cartel the biotech cartel the global media mainstream media, etc. You look at what we know now about how that works and what its, what its game is and what its methods of manipulation are compared with not even 22 years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, then what I was told on that March day in 1990 about this transformation of human society and the effect of this vibrational information change is demonstrably happening and, 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 and has been happening for a while now and it's getting more and more powerful. I mean, the people who are now beginning to go, hold on a second, I'm looking at myself and the world in a different way suddenly, you know, are people who just a little while ago you'd say, never them, never them, they will never break out of the box in their lifetime because they seem to be so uh, okay. enslaved by it. And now even some of those um, uh, people who were absolutely system program people uh, are now beginning to, to see it. So, and it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, coming around to, to, to one of the points of your question yeah. is, yeah. is 
Well, do you think I, I, your higher I, self is, is a benevolent intelligence? Well, this is an interesting thing because you would think when I was contacted in that way in 1990 that I would have been desperate to know who it was, names, dates, places, come on, all this stuff. But I wasn't. Um, it was like um, something within me knew that, that for whatever reason I'd come to do something and this was fundamentally connected to it. And so there wasn't this battle between David Icke, television presenter, Green Party spokesman, um, and this, this experience which it's like I knew and so it felt so right to me I just went with it and what happened after that uh, that uh, experience and another that something similar happened um, uh, a week later when I went back and the contact continued and one of the messages that came through that time was one man cannot change the world but one man can communicate the message that can change the world and this is a vital fact this is not about me it's about the information that's what is that's the transforming thing here and I, for all these years over two decades now every now and again you might have a little thought you know I wonder, wonder what this force is that you know um, because it was blatant from that, those, those, that experience with Betty Shine, from, from then on, that when the, the communication said through her that they were going to put information into my mind and, and other times they were going to lead me to knowledge, that um, I, there was no need for arduous seeking. All I had to do was follow the clues they would give me because it was all arranged a long time ago and before I kind of came here as David Icke. Um, from that time, absolutely that happened. Um, it was, it's been like some hidden force handing me pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, um, virtually in the order necessary for me to see where they go. And, and it, if that had not been happening all this time, um, I would not have produced all these books. I would not have been uh, 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 put together all this information. I would not have connected all these dots. If just the David Icke level of me, I'd been left to get on with it. I might still be on book two, and it would be nothing nearly uh, as uh, expansive as what it is. There is a force, and only very recently, um, because I had this feeling that I uh, wanted to go back to Peru where so much happened to me in uh, February 1991. Incredible experiences, paranormal experiences you would call them. Um, I've just had this feeling for like six months or even a bit more, I, I, I need to go back to Peru and I was going to go back on my own. And then some organizers in Australia who I worked with last year said, well, why don't you get some other people to come, come with you and we'll make it, a, make it an event that every, you know, more people can share. So. Uh, because of that, my mind has actually been turning even more recently to what is this force? Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that at some point um, I am going to get very clear confirmation of what it is. I don't see it, you see. I don't see it as um, like uh, um, extraterrestrials in some ship or something like that. I see it as a level of awareness, a level of consciousness. And in the end, um, while we perceive ourselves as so-called humans and our name and job and income bracket and all the rest of it, um, we are all, in the end, if we open to it, we are all higher realms of consciousness. So in the end, because everything is one, mm -hmm. at some level we communicate with ourselves. The question is, how, how expanded is that level of self that you are communicating with because if you shut out the higher levels of self you get pulled into mind body which is basically uh, filtering and decoding and perceiving everything through the five senses which is a very very low narrow incredibly limited um, 
range of, of perception and, and that's where most humans have been and still are because the system has been structured to put them there and this is a key reason why when people who throughout history whoever they are who have opened their mind to a, to a, to a greater consciousness uh, not it means that they're special and, and, and you know messiahs it just means they've opened their mind to what anyone can higher levels of awareness so your point of observation of everything changes that's why they have been ridiculed and, and, and or condemned or dismissed throughout history because what they are perceiving what they are decoding is not being perceived and decoded by the vast majority of people who are still in, in that closed-minded uh, state and thus it's it's like um, a person talking one language trying to understand a person talking another language they just don't understand what you're talking about mate. but what's interesting is as this uh, this collective awakening ha it happens people are going through the same process and so more and more people are starting to look at what I'm saying because they're starting to decode the same stuff and it start, therefore it's starting to make sense to them Could you tell us about any of these uh, paranormal experiences? Something that happened recently for example well, well, what happened? Um, what happened in Peru was a life-changing experience, um, and funnily enough, the organisers of, of the the return to Peru, you know, group of people, um, they're gonna they're, they've organised it so that my 60th birthday will be um, celebrated, if you like, in a stone circle in Peru, and it's for a particular reason. Um, after the Betty Shine experience, um, the old life fell apart. Um, very soon after, within like two months, maybe slightly more, of the meeting with Betty Shine, the BBC announced they weren't going to renew my contracts, so I was out of work. Um, and I could have looked for other media work, but this was telling me, don't, no, 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 there's another road now. And so I didn't, and I spent 1990 basically walking around going, you know, what's happening to me? What's I'm trying to get together what was happening and where I was supposed to go. And it was bewildering really. And I, in, but in that period, I put together a book, which I called Truth Vibrations. After this vibrational change, I was told was going was to come and demonstrably it's here now. Um, and then when that went off to the printers in late 1990, I started getting this uh, constant recurring feeling, I need to go to Peru. Now, I, I'd never thought about Peru before. I've seen the football team play in the World Cup, and that was the end of my experience of Peru. But it was so powerful. And by now, and this was a big thing that happened after the Betty Shine experience, was that my intuition was now governor. When this said, what, 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 what are you doing, what are you doing? And this said, you've got to do this, you need to do this, I need to do this. Then this would always, always um, decide action and direction. And that's been the same to this, to this minute. Um, because this intuit intuition knows, this thinks and tries to work it out. This knows because it's accessing a much more expanded level of awareness and consciousness than this is. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you look at people, uh, so many people, because of the fear, it's, it, it's interesting, as we keep talking, all these different strands come together and connect. Um, the fear of what other people think gets people to deny and suppress their intuitive knowing. I just know I've got to do this. I just know I need to go there. You can't do that. What will people think if you... I, and, and, and so, again, being cleared out of that fear of what other people thought allowed this to take center stage in the direction of my life. Um, and so the intuition said go to Peru. So purely on that, I got on a plane to Peru in February 1991. And I had no idea why I was going, except I knew I had to go. And it's a long story, an amazing story, but from the moment I landed 
strange things started to happen. Like someone would walk out the crowd to me, which they did, because you know Lima Airport at like six o'clock in the or five thirty in the morning or five o'clock in the morning, I think it was when I arrived, um, was just packed with people. And, and and I'm standing there. I've got off a plane from uh, America, and I'm thinking, what now? Why am I here? That's what that's what, that's that's how it was done. And then this person just walks out, this fellow walks out through this mass of people and said, where you go? And, and the only thing I'd read about before I came out, it happened very quickly, was, was Cusco in the Andes, the center of the or Inca civilization. So I'm thinking, Cusco, I said, Cusco. And there was, a, there was a plane going, and it was about, it was going to take off in about, I don't know, half an hour, maybe, maybe 40 minutes after I arrived. So I'm thinking, I'm never going to get that. Uh, he said, I get you a ticket. No, he said to me, have you got a ticket? No, I get you a ticket. Do you have a hotel? No, I get you a hotel. And off he goes, because he's on a commission. And so then he gets me this ticket, and there's this massive queue for the Cusco flight. And I go to the back, being English, and um, he said, no, 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 follow me. And he took me down the front of the queue, and his friend was checking people in, and he checked me in. Next. I was like, what? So... Less than an hour after I arrived in Lima, I'm walking across the tarmac to get on a plane to Cusco. And from that moment on, this, this whole synchronistic uh, series of events happened. For instance, I, when I got to, um, to Cusco, I'm now in the hotel, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, what now? And someone had said to me, if you need any help in Peru, this a friend, this is a friend of mine, give him a call. So I called them, and because they, they worked in a local travel agency in Cusco. And I, they said, well, come and see me. And I went to see them, and, and they, said they, they then got on the phone organizing all my travel, Machu Picchu, and all this stuff for the next two weeks, three weeks. He said, she said, you need a guide. So I've got just the one, picks up the phone, talk, talking in, in a language I didn't understand, and then I went around to see this guy the next morning, and we were going to go off, and he was going to take me around Peru. It was a, a, a professional Peruvian guide in all, all the Peruvian uh, clothes you'd expect. Um, and I, I went round to his home to, to, to join up with him the next morning. And I, I knocked the door. There was no answer. And I pushed the door and it opened. So I walked in and walked into I'm, look, I'm looking. And there he is. He's, he's, he's not in bed. He's asleep on the floor with his hat on and his you know, blanket. And he's, he's kind of, he, he looks up at me and he said, not hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. He said, Do you have any dreams last night? <laughs> Thinking, What? And fully enough, I had. I'd had this absolutely vivid dream the night before that one of these two middle front teeth had fallen out. So I told him, He said, um, Is your father or grandfather still alive? I said, Yeah, my father is, yeah. He said, I said, Why? He said, Because that's often symbolic of your grandfather or father died. Next time I got a phone call to England, a few days later, the father had died back in England. I, in fact, you know, the funeral had happened before I even realized he died, because, you know, once you get into the wilds of, of Peru, the, the communication with, 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 with Britain, forget it. Um, and, well, in those days, anyway. And uh, so we, 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 we go around, we go to Machu Picchu, we go to all these places, and eventually um, we come to a place called Puno, um, in southern Peru, uh, and he, he he was organizing and you know all the stuff um, in league with this travel agency, and and the books us into this hotel called the Siustani, and Siustani is a, an Inca um, ruin um, about an hour an hour and a half drive from Puno, and because it's named after this ruin, there's pictures of it all over the hotel. And every time I looked at these pictures, something was saying, you need to go there, you need to go there, you need to go there, you need to go there. So I, I, I said to this Peruvian guy, I, I want to go there. And it was a kind of funny sequence throughout this trip with him, because every day this would say, you need to do this. And I'd say, I need to go there. And every day he would tell me it wasn't possible. And every day we'd end up there. And it was the same with Pu with, with C. Ustani. Anyway, so we get it. He said, we have to hire this bus, this little bus. Well, actually, he didn't. He could get a cab, but... I learned later, but obviously he took some money for that. Fair enough. And, and me, him, and the tourist bus driver go out to see Ustani. And it's this 
um, completely or virtually uninhabited. There are some houses, but not many. Area, um, and there's a hill with all the ruins on top, and then there's a, like a lagoon around it. Beautiful, and then if you look in in any direction, there's distant mountains. And there was no one there except two children with a llama for tourist photographs. So there were no tourists apart from me. Um, and I, I, I went up and I, I walked around um, the ruin. And it was, lo it was lovely. It was beautiful and, and nice. But the, uh, at the end, after about an hour, I'm thinking, it was great, but it did not match the urge. This was telling me I had to go to that place. So anyway, I got, in, I got back in the bus with me and the, 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 the driver and the, the guide, and I was quite disappointed, really. I thought, mm, I expected something different, more, given the urge I had. So we, we, we're driving away, and about three minutes down the road, I'm, I'm looking out the window, and I'm just kind of uh, daydreaming, as I do a lot. And then I, I see this hill, mound, whatever you want to call it, to my right, and I'm looking at it. And as I was looking at it, all I could hear in my head was, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. And you know, you think, a man's talking to me, you know, this is crazy. What's happening to my life? So I said to the guy, could you stop the, could you stop the bus? I want to go up that mound. I said, I won't be long. And uh, I was quite a time, actually. And I, I walked up the mound to the top, and, and I couldn't see it from the road. But when I got to the top, there was this big stone circle, um, which I'm going to go back to. Uh, and I walk, I'm just like, whoa, stone circle. And I walked into the middle of it. Um, and over there was Siyustani, just, just across the way. Distant mountains and then all this, you know, pretty much uninhabited land as far as the eye could see. And I walked to the center of the circle and I, I, I got the feet again. I got like the, the, the burning in the feet, like some magnetism was pulling my feet down, like in the, like in the news. Uh, bookshop in, 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 in Ride down the road here. And then two very clear, again, strong thoughts, voice, whatever you like, um, went through my head. The first one said, they'll be talking about this a hundred years from now. And the second one was, it will be over when you feel the rain. And I'm looking up at a cloudless Peruvian sky with a piercing sun and I'm hearing in my, in my head, my mind, it will be over when you feel the rain. It just seemed to be the conclusion, the climax of the ludicrous direction my life had gone. There's no way. What do you mean it'll be over when you feel the rain? Anyway, what I was feeling as I was standing there was like a drill going into the top of my head and threw my body into the ground. I was feeling another flow coming back and out the top of my head. And then my arms went out at 45 degrees, you know, like that, um, without me making any decision to do it. And you can't hold your, your shoulders like that, I can't anyway, for very long before they start that, to ache. But mine were like that for, must have been, I don't know, 40 minutes, maybe more, while this process situation happened to me, because this energy coming through me got more and more powerful until I was literally shaking standing there and I was going in and out of, of like my conscious mind you know like you drive a car and you can't remember where the last two miles went because you, 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 you've been in another you've been in a the subconscious level um, and then when one of these times when I came back to my conscious mind awareness if you like I, I, I realized that over the distant mountains and it was quite a long way away um, there was this light grey mist and it got darker very quickly and I thought it's raining and and over the next I don't know what it must have been half an hour uh, this rainstorm came out of the mountains and the weather forecasters talk about um, weather fronts well this was a weather front the front of this storm was dead straight, like someone had drawn it with a ruler, and it was coming towards me. It covered the sun eventually, and it was all happening ridiculously quickly. And I was looking, I was looking up as it got closer, and this, this, all this, these billowing clouds, like dry ice on a stage, and I could see faces in them and stuff like that. And eventually, I'm looking at this wall 
of stair rod rain coming towards me. I mean, if you did it as special effects in a movie, people would say, that's ridiculous, that's just far-fetched. It happened. And as it came towards me, I'm now absolutely at the peak of this energetic whatever heck was going on. And, uh, and then the rain hit me, and I was instantly soaked because it was so, you know, immense, the wall of rain. And as it hit me, all this energy stopped. Um, and uh, my life was never the same again uh, because I had energy pouring out of my hands um, for hours um, and I had a, a crystal with me and I, I was holding this crystal to try to take this energy out and, and it was pouring out of my feet and I couldn't sleep that night because it continued. and. I came back to Britain, many other things happened in Peru as well, but I came back to Britain um, and, and the book The Truth Vibrations was coming out and, I, and, I, and, and the media started to get hold of the fact that something strange was happening to me. And that's when I, I went on the, the, the chat show on the BBC prime time called The Wogan Show and, and, and the ridicule started in earnest. But what happened after that experience in Peru is that for three months, it was about three months, maybe slightly more, um, I didn't know what was going on. It, I can see it now as I, as I look back at it, that, that whatever hit me in Peru burst that bubble that we live in. And with the bubble bursting, information and concepts and perceptions poured into my conscious mind. and, and you, you just couldn't process it. You know when you press too many keys on a computer, it freezes because it can't process so much information at the same time. Well, that was, but that was what happened to me. And so for three months, I, I, I mean, I didn't know what planet I was on, where I was, or anything. And, and then one day, after all the ridicule and all the stuff, and that's all people remember because the media's in a time warp um, on that in, the, in this country. And suddenly it was like, everything morphed into clarity. It was like the computer just unfroze. And now, you know, people were saying to me, who knew me, hey, I, I thought you'd gone mad. You're the same guy I, I've always known. Well, on the outside, I was. David Icke was back, if you like, but not the one that had left, because now I could see the world in a completely different way, and, and, and I could see um, what I couldn't see before in terms of the way the world was being manipulated in a very coordinated fashion while being presented to us as random events that aren't connected and, and you know mm -hmm. I've come on from there. Coming to all these subjects because we, we were uh, before talking about uh, the need to open to a greater consciousness but at the same time you are also very conscious of the manipulation through things like new era and, and people feeling that they are contacting with high beings and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And and, and feeling with the heart and things like this, but at the, you know, at the bottom of, of, of the question is how come many people can feel the difference between opening to a higher uh, benevolent influence or to a manipul non manipulative uh, force? Yeah, this is, this is a very interesting question uh, and a very, very important one. You know, I see so many people over the years who um, for want of a collective term, come from a, a new age direction and, and call themselves spiritual and all this stuff. And it's words. It's words. They're not, they're not um, open to a higher level of consciousness. They are still in their mind. They're still in the box. But all they're doing is expressing the box in a different way. Um, you know, I've met some really lovely people um, who might be termed New Age, um, genuine people. But some of the most uh, vindictive, manipulative, um, deeply, deeply uh, unpleasant people that I've met in my life have, have been love and lighters. Because um, for them it's all words, it, it's, it's all selling an image to hide the fact that behind it is something very different. And it seems to me that the harder you try to sell an image, the, the more blatant it is that there's something behind the image you want to hide. Because 
it, you don't have to sell the real you. You have to sell um, uh, a a facade of you um, because the real you doesn't need selling. Um, and and so you if you if you kind of open your uh, self to other levels of reality. The question is absolutely um, what level of reality? Because you know, so many uh, people, um, especially in the in the realm of this cabal, big time, are actually having their mental and emotional what passes for emotion, their mental and emotional processes uh, possessed by um, entities and um, uh, projected possession. Um, that is controlling their thoughts and dictating their actions and perceptions in a very, very deeply malevolent, horrific way. So it's not connecting to something else, it's what are you connecting to. And in the end, um, what I've found over, over the years is there's a certain resonance and, and I've learned to trust it, and I've learned to trust it because it's proved to be accurate so many times. In the end, that's that's the outcome. These, this, it, it, is, is, are these different things you're perceiving in terms of communication, do they prove to be accurate or not? Um, and there's a certain resonance when, when I look at something, and, and there's a resonance that goes, yes, 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 and there's another one that goes, no, no, no. And I've, I've learned to... to, to to um, to feel that and and, and, and uh, see it, um, and you know I've had people say to me, insiders, and they say you know you've um, you quoted a disinformer in your book. I said really, and they said yeah, but you've only quoted him on what's true, <laughs> right? Because disinformers don't tell you 100% nonsense. It's partly true to pull you in, and then they twist it. And he said, how can you do that? I said, well, I didn't knowingly do it. But something of what he was saying went, yes, yeah. And the other one went, no. no. And, and so there's an energetic resonance that you feel. And then there's the other thing, which is, what is the outcome of this? What is the direction um, that you're being taken by this, which is guiding you, influencing you, if you like? And... When I, you know, I look at what I do and what I've done for 22 years and, and I'm following this, this guidance, if you like, I've, um, I've dedicated my life completely. I mean, I live alone. I've lived alone for five years and, and, and in this little flat and this is where I, where I work all the time if I'm not traveling. And I've, I've dedicated my life, thanks to all this, to uncovering how people are manipulated, how people uh, individually and collectively are suppressed, um, the techniques of manipulation and suppression, um, where this cabal wants to take us, what the cabal is connected to, and absolutely prime for all that to be dealt with, who are we, where are we, and what is reality? And so, when I look at the direction I've been taken, taken and the information that's come to the surface as a result of that, information that talks about, you know, loving each other rather than hating each other, um, cooperating rather than competing, and all these things, coming together, putting down the fault lines that divide us of religion and race and, and culture and stuff. I mean... Let people have them. Good luck to them. None of my business. But don't let them be this, this divide and rule uh, fault line network that they are that they've allowed to become. When I look at all that, when I look at the fact that nothing that I've been uh, guided to communicate is about people fighting each other, hating each other, being violent or anything, then I look at that and I think, that will do me. I'm, I'm happy with the direction and the nature of the information that I'm being, I've been guided to communicate. And, and, and that feels to me as if there is some force that has the interests of, of humanity at heart that is trying to um, 
bring an end to this, this these eons of human control, suppression, and um, horrific um, treatment of, of of people in so many ways uh, over thousands and thousands of years. So I, I'm at peace with that. If um, if this guidance and, and, and everything was saying we must take up arms and fight the enemy, we must hate those that that um, uh, suppress us. Uh, we must uh, we must hang them from trees. Then I'm thinking, hold on a second, this ain't a force for good. But that's not what's happened. So that that's how I I've, I've worked with it anyway. What do you think is the structure of reality? People are talking about dimensions, timelines. It's, it's becoming a mess, you know, every, every day more and more. Well, you know, how really is the structure of this reality, and who's behind it? Well, you know, it, it, this this process of of this hidden force guiding me. You know, you only have to follow the clues. It was all, work, uh, you know, decided a long time ago, organized a long time ago. Um, it's it's taken me through many different phases. First of all, in the early years, after um, the Betty Shine Peru experience, it was all about if you like, the five sense level of this. It was about um, a cabal of families controlling the different facets of human society. It was about manipulated wars, manipulated terrorist events, and all this stuff. And then it moved through the, the mid to late 90s into this area that's kind of phased a lot of people, um, that there are non-human entities behind this. Which would seem to be dominated by a reptilian form, but there are many others in league with them. Um, and then, from about 2002, 2003, came for me the most important part, which was when the pieces in the puzzle started to take me down the road to, to understanding the nature of reality itself. Um, and only from that perspective can you A, see where the answers lie, and also B, um, in any way, fully understand uh, the way uh, the conspiracy works and the depth of it. It's clear to me, 22 years on, that if you are an expert on 9-11, an expert on banking scams and political scams and manipulated uh, wars, all of which are absolutely necessary to people to know, and I do all that myself, but if that's all you do, you're still walking around the outer rim of the rabbit hole. You've not even entered it yet. And to understand the nature of reality is to, at least the, the foundations of it, the themes of it, is to um, understand the depth of this conspiracy and how it works. Um, it's, it's, it's my view that, and, and increasingly, it's, it's, people are moving in this direction when they see the evidence that this um, universe, at its foundation, is uh, a waveform um, resonance um, information construct. Um, it's, if you like, a harmonic information construct. That's the foundation, and that's the foundation of uh, the human form and everything in this universe. We then decode that information through from the vibrational to the electrical, which is then fed to the, the brain and the genetic structure, which decodes that um, into um, the, the form that we experience, which is a holographic reality, which appears to be solid, but can't be. I mean, you know, this is why in quantum physics they have this uh, mystery of how atoms are supposed to make up a solid world, but atoms have no solidity whatsoever. How can that be? The answer is you don't have to have solid atoms to create this reality, because this reality isn't solid. It's a hologram, holographic reality. And if you um, look at uh, holograms that, that people you know make and sell and stuff. 
the best of them look as solid as you and me, but you can put your hand through them. I mean, they're just delusions. They're illusory physically. And therefore, it's a decoding process. And, you know, when, when you're pushing against something like a wall and, and you can't get through it, we decode that through to the holographic level as um, solid pushing against solid. But actually, it is an it a, a electromagnetic resistance uh, that's, that's causing that. Um, and, if, and if you can change your electromagnetic state, uh, in other words, you can change your vibrational state, then you can perform what are called miracles. You know, I mean, uh, how, how can this world be real when, as we, as we experience it, when you, you walk through fire, you get burned. When you walk through fire in a state of awareness or a state of relief, that when you walk through fire, you get burned. But you go into another level of awareness, I've seen it done, and you can walk through fire and not get burned. Because, you know, um, something can only burn something else if you, if, if, if you decode it that way. An illusion can't burn an illusion unless you decode it that way. Because in the end, it's all energy. It's all um, information fields. We just decode them through. Now, the classic um, vibration to electrical to, to, to perception is the ear. All the five senses are, are there to turn vibrational information into electrical information, which the, the brain then constructs into this reality, um, or the whole genetic structure does. Um, so you, 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 you get the vibration in the ear, because when I'm speaking, my words are not passing between us. A vibrational field of information um, generated by my vocal cords is passing between us. And the only time you hear what I'm speaking is when you decode that information mm -hmm. through the ear into the brain. So, um, this is, I mean, I could talk forever about the illusory nature of reality and what we take to be real. Um, and thus, this um, universe is a harmonic waveform information field which is decoded through into this reality. Now, I talk in my books about uh, what I call the hack or the distortion. Um, and if, if I go on the internet with a computer, a computer expert um, could hack into a website and or hack into a computer and could actually firewall it off so that we don't decode vast tracts of the internet. I mean classic example is China where they firewall off their computer system so Chinese people can't access a vast amount of the internet that the rest of us can, well until they give them time. Um, and so when you see how this universe is a an information construct and how we decode from that construct into this reality and our state of being and our the expanded or unexpanded nature of our reality and perception is deciding what we are going to decode out of that field and what we aren't. That's why some people will, will, will get perceptions or experiences and other people won't uh, get that perception or, or have that experience. Um, and when you understand that, two things can happen, and I suggest they have happened. One, you can manipulate the genetic structure, the decoding process, what I call body-mind-computer, so that it will not access vast chunks of that information field, just like the computer system in China. And when, um, quite early on in this story, in the early 1990s, all, you know, pretty much after it, it all began to start for me, one of the earliest things I came across was um, interbreeding between humans and non-humans, uh, which are uh, recorded in ancient accounts in virtually, if not every, culture in the world. They give them different names, but, uh, uh, you know, for the, the entities involved in the interbreeding or the, the, the name of the group, 
it could be Chittahori or Anunnaki or whatever. Um, but it's the same theme. And the theme is of a genetic manipulation of the human form. And we see genetic manipulation from our you know, perception of, of reality. What these manipulating entities see, and the way I see it now, is it's like, um, it's like a, a, a biological computer. And you can program it and you can change how it decodes reality. And it's interesting that depending what scientists you talk to, um, they say that between 90 and 98 percent of human DNA is what they call junk DNA or non-coding DNA because they don't know what it does. So it's the idea that you'll know, we'll call it junk because we don't know what it does. I mean, the idea that 90 to 98 percent of human DNA has no purpose is ludicrous. The question is, what is its purpose? And what I find fascinating, because it really is the direction that I've been going for a long time now, is that some cutting edge open minded scientists who have looked at this, they are um, coming up with the fact and discovering the fact that absolutely it has a purpose, this non coding junk DNA, and also it has its own language, which is very different to the DNA we seem to know about or think we know about. And what I'm suggesting in, in, in my uh, newer books is that within non-coding DNA, a software program, as I would call it, has been put into the human genetics. And it is running human perception. Um, if I put a software disk in a computer and I press the right buttons, then that computer's reality on the screen will be that software program. And, you know, when you think how human emotion is one of the greatest controllers, suppressors, um, uh, and uh, drivers of human behavior and perception, and then you realize that actually the way the body reacts to emotion of various kinds is not the body reacting to some external thing. The emotion is coming, human emotion as we, we perceive it and experience it, is coming from the body. And what I'm saying is it's coming from this software program within non-coding junk DNA. And if you are in body-mind, five sense uh, reality alone, then there is a very, very good chance that you go your entire life in this world without having a single original thought or emotional response that hasn't come from the software program. Um, that's the scale of human control. And that's how deep the rabbit hole goes. And it's only as far as, as, as we are now. Um, so we have the thoughts and we have the emotional responses, but where are they coming from? You know, when you, you, you see people like um, Carl Jung, the famous Swiss psychiatrist and others who talk about archetypes, they say um, that they can basically break down human personalities into 12 big archetypes and combinations of them. Some others are too, but really major ones. Um, well, hold on a second. We live within all possibility, infinite possibility, and you can break down human personalities into, into not many archetypes and combinations of them. What, what's going on? You can't break um, infinite possibility down into a few archetypal personality types, but you can if it's a software program. You absolutely can then. Um, and so that is, is running through uh, human, uh, the, the, the human system. And, you know, if you go into a, a quiet state, um, and you, you, can, you can do this if, if, you, if, you, if you work at it, you can literally observe your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know the chatter in the head never stops. You know, 
I'm go, you're going you go into a quiet space. No, 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 no. What, have you, what did I say? No, 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 no. And we take that to be us. But you can go into these states of awareness where you literally just move back and observe your own thoughts. And you can, and you, and you can listen to them. And you, you can observe them and going, it's ridiculous, this all. This is ridiculous. What are you doing? And, and, but then you, the question comes, what's observing those thoughts? The real you. What are those thoughts? The software program. And what the system has done, systematically, is to get us to identify, confuse who we really are with the software personalities that we're given. And so, when you start to break out of the software dominance, um, and you move your point of observation beyond the program into the realms of true consciousness, then those who are still running the program thinking it's them, they're going to think you are insane or dangerous or ridiculous because they literally, literally cannot compute through the software what they're doing, uh, what you're saying rather. And so this is what the awakening is that I was told about 22 years ago. It's breaking open the mind to move your point of observation from the software program into levels of our awareness that are beyond the software program. And at that point, you can see what the software program is actually there for us not to see, which is all the things that are going on around us that we, we don't connect, we don't think are possible because the software program is telling us what to believe. And then it goes to the next level because as these pieces in the puzzle um, started being started going into this direction, you have the software program running through the human body computer, if you like, which we take to be us, and that's incidentally why, you know, if you if you if you type data into a computer and then you press enter, you pretty much know. Well, you bloody well know what that computer is going to do because it's programmed to do it in response to that data. Press enter. Wherever you go in the world and you, you watch people in different situations, i.e. the situation being the data on the computer, then you press enter, i.e. the response of people to that situation. All over the world, invariably, you will see people of different cultures and what have you react in the same way, usually through emotional responses in the same way. Why? We live in infinite possibility. There are infinite possibilities to react to that situation. But the, but, but the same ones keep recurring. Why the same reason? And so there's that, but there's also um, what I call the hack, which is that this force that is behind human suppression and behind the, the human, apparently human families that are behind the suppression in the, the world that we live in, has created a fake reality. It's hacked into the, um, the information construct of the universe, this part of it anyway. And it has created a fake reality which is being fed to us. I think the moon's involved in this. As I go into in, in the latest book, Remember Who You Are, Saturn is big time involved in this. And, and, and pennies started to drop um, when I was writing this, this latest book particularly of why, as people have been pointing out for years, researchers, that Saturn symbolism is everywhere. Um, and um, when you look at it, um, it, courts, governments, secret societies, Saturn symbolism anywhere, everywhere. So you say, why? Why is Saturn symbolism everywhere? And then you realize the, 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 the impact of Saturn and, and you start to realize why these secret societies and governments and everything and society in general the structure of it, the authorities of it, are obsessed with Saturn symbolism. And it's like um, uh, we should be decoding a much wider range 
of information, i.e. Um, decoding a much wider range of information into our experienced reality. But this hack in, in, in um, conjunction with this genetic manipulation has put us in a tiny, tiny frequency range, mm -hmm. which people don't realize how tiny it is. The electromagnetic spectrum, according to mainstream science, is, some people say, about 0.005% of what exists in this universe in mass and matter. Some people say it's a bit more, but not much. Visible light, which is the only frequency range that we can decode into a reality we can see, is a fraction of the 0.005%. People think when they look, look out their eyes that they're seeing everything that exists in the space that they're observing. No, no. They're, ex they're experiencing a tiny band of frequency. And all the rest of the universe and multi multiverses and, and, and infinity in general is all sharing the same space. Space is an illusion too, really, um, that I'm sitting in. And it's all existing in this space. But because the, this is programmed to only decode this narrow band of frequencies we call visible light, this is the only band that I can see. And thus, when, you, when people talk about the paranormal and all that stuff, and ghosts and, and, and things appearing and disappearing, well, they haven't appeared and disappeared. But if they enter our frequency range, we decode them. That, that it appeared out of nowhere, and then it leaves our frequency range. We can't decode it anywhere any, anymore. It disappeared in front of my eyes. No, it didn't. You were cease, You ceased to be able to decode it because it left the frequency range you can decode. So once you realise this, all this paranormal stuff becomes perfectly explainable. So what we call extraterrestrial actually is it, not extra anything because it's just sharing our own reality on different dimensions on different levels. Yeah, I, I prefer to use the term uh, interdimensionals for that reason. And, and, and this, this, this force that I'm saying is manipulating our world operates overwhelmingly outside of the frequency range that we can decode. Um, because that's its, its state, that's its vibrational state, basically. That's that, that, you know, what you're vibrating to, you experience. I mean, you know, it's like um, a radio. Uh, if you tune it to Radio 1, you, your, your experience is Radio 1, because that's the frequency you're tuned to. Move the dial to Radio 2, now your experience is Radio 2. But if you're on Radio 2, you cannot experience Radio 1. It's a different frequency. It's real uh, simple that way. And so to manipulate our reality, this force, which very much takes a reptilian form, uh, among others, but um, actually in the end goes out of the realms of form into, into, into uh, realms of pure awareness, um, it needs to manipulate our world. It needs um, people, if you like, human body computers, within this frequency range so it can manipulate um, us um, by controlling the banking system and the, 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 all the stuff and thus this is where these hybrid bloodlines come from which are, which the the ancients all over the world talked about the creation of these hybrid bloodlines and these hybrid bloodlines became known in the ancient world as the demigods part human part gods as they were perceived because there was a genetic creation which um, in one level is, is as human genetics, but has a massive infusion of reptilian genetics. Um, and these are the bloodlines that run the banking system, the, the, the political system, own the media and all that stuff. And this is where the whole um, theme of royalty comes from, an aristocracy. Um, the idea of the divine right to rule and which is what? The, 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 the right to rule over people because of your genetics. I mean, uh, uh, two hours from here, in London, we have um, a head of state, Queen Elizabeth, who is only head of state because of her bloodline, or genetics. Um, uh, the, the ancient Chinese emperors used to claim the right to be emperor because of their genetic connection to the serpent gods, um, and so on and so forth. It was this hybrid genetics that this whole royalty, arist 
uh, aristocracy uh, stuff all over the world came from. Um, and when, um, for a, obviously for a long time, the aristocracy and the, uh, the, the royal families of the world ran the show. Um, but then when people started to rebel against that obvious dictatorship, these bloodlines moved, some of them still are, like the British royal family, at big time, but they started to move out of um, over royalty and aristocracy and into the professions of banking and politics and business and all the rest of it. Um, and they've gone on con controlling and manipulating ever since. So they control, they've uh, created a political system that allows them to put into power basically whoever they want now. Um, th through this illusion of democracy. But these, these dark suits are actually, um, they still perceive themselves, even though it's now covert, as special bloodlines, you know, who, 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 who are above everyone else. And, and while some are overtly doing that, like the British royal family, the Spanish royal family, um, most of them are operating uh, under the radar in, in society in general, but they're still the ones who are the, the hybrid um, uh, the hybrid representatives of these uh, this force, these entities that operate outside of human sight. And just a very quick analogy. Um, when scientists are working with something that's too dangerous, that they can't directly interact with it, you'll see them put the material in a tank They'll stand outside the tank and then they'll put these long gloves on to work with the material in the tank. Well, if you take the scientists to be these entities operating outside of human uh, perception, you take the tank to be our reality and you take the gloves to be these bloodlines that are representatives within this reality of this force. That is, is basically the, the dynamic, the association between them.